Great. Well, welcome everybody in the in the extended Q and A area. It actually took me a little bit longer to get here, but uh, I see that Gladys was able to join. So we're going to take about thirty minutes here to continue some of the questions. If you have questions that you want to ask on screen, you can ask to share your screen, and I'll try to see uh, how many people I can bring on. There's been a lot of questions in um in the main stage area that I want to pick up on actually. Here's a an Ebola related question. We'll start with that. Ebola has been documented in mountain gorillas. And have there been any suspected cases of COVID-19 in mountain gorillas? Um, that's a great question. Um, I just wanted to correct that Ebola hasn't been documented in mountain gorillas, but it's, it's been documented in other gorillas, the Western lowland gorillas, in, uh, which are many more, luckily, than the mountain gorillas, but it's been documented there. And sadly, the gorillas have died immediately. Um, luckily, we've not had it in mountain gorillas. We're very worried about COVID-19 getting into the gorillas, and luckily, it's not got into the gorillas. Okay, uh, we'll um, uh, we'll uh, take another question related to coffee, um, and then I think we're going to be joined by by Stephen. Um, actually, we'll 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 take a question from Stephen first. So, Stephen, great to see you. Well, it's um, great to be here. It's nice to see you, Gladys and Lawrence. Did you have a Let's question for, for Gladys? No, I, I just wanted to, well, I wanted to know how the public health programs are going that you had, uh, particularly the ones on uh, on hygiene around the park that, that you, had, uh, you had active when we visited you several years ago. Thank you. And uh, I'll take Stephen off screen when you can answer his question and I'll, I'll continue with others. Nice to see you again, Steve. Um, the public health programs have grown since you last came. When you came, we had like 29 volunteers, and now we have as many as 270. Um, and they're going around. We found that we needed to have more volunteers because we went to more parishes where gorillas come out, which had more villages. And we found that we needed more volunteers in each village. So instead of each one being in charge of 100 homes, each one is now in charge of 35 homes, and they're much more effective. And I can say that during the COVID-19 pandemic, because we focused a lot on hand hygiene, um, the number of hand washing facilities around people's homes has drastically gone up as a result of the pandemic. So we're really pleased about that. But it was so nice to host you, Florence, Cherry, everybody when you came over. Great. I, 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 see, a number of, uh, I see a number of other questions. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll bounce back and forth between topics. But Lawrence, there are a number of questions for, for you come in about your story, your involvement. How did you, how did you get involved in this? Um, there's a question about how to include hip hop artists from political to conservation efforts. Can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yes, I, I grew up as a UN brat. Uh, my parents were UN peacekeepers. Uh, since 1980s, uh, they did the other tour. Uh, they served in uh, Lebanon, they served in uh, Syria, they served in East Timor, they served in Liberia. And as a UN brat, uh, I realized that uh, I wanted to study international relations and I backed it up with a telecommunications degree from State University of New York Institute of Technology. Um, so my involvement in conservation through public health, Gorilla Conservation Coffee, Gorilla Conservation Camp, and even promoting my wife, Dr. Gladys, is on uh, multiple levels. So uh, Team Gorilla. <laughs> Team Gorilla song is uh, one of the efforts that we've made. It's available on Tidal with Jay-Z. It's available uh, in so many platforms in California. And we encourage you all to try to take a look at it and see how you can support conservation through music. At the same time, uh, yes, Gorilla Conservation Coffee is another initiative that supports the work of Dr. Gladys and the team. And uh, we look forward to your engagement. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're also on uh, Facebook and YouTube. So please uh, tune in for updates. And just to add to that, um, the, thing, the person who um, created Team Gorilla was very, very upset when Rafiki was killed by the vulture. He's a local Ugandan artist called Gasuza. Um, actually, his mom used to work for the UN. And uh, he's really, um, he was so emotional about it. And he was very upset. So the song is just so beautiful because he talks about how gorillas are so similar to us. Same ha similar hands and feet, you know, same DNA. 
it's really a beautiful song. You should buy it. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I just tried to bring uh, Susan up on screen, but she disappeared. But we are joined by Sh Shawnee. So Shawnee, it's great to see you. I'm glad you could join in. Do you have a, a question for um, for Gladys and Lawrence or the rest of the CTPH team? Yes, uh, yes, I do. It's good to see you again, by the way. <clears throat> but um, I, my question is <laughs> about the seedling. Uh, do you have a like a team that starts with seeds and is growing seedlings and then you give seedlings to the um, community? Yes, we do. Um, what we do is we're working with an agricultural expert. He's actually the one who's managing the Gorilla Conservation Coffee. He's an agronomist. And what we've done is we've got six different, no, ten different crops, and six of them are like tomatoes, onions, kale, spinach, um, cabbage. And he's, he's making them all, and groundnuts into seedlings. And then also we're getting seeds for pumpkins and uh, maize and beans. And these are staple diet that people normally eat, but right now, you know, they went away from farming when tourism began and now they're starving. So we, we're basically giving people seedlings which have already grown. We're planting them at our center, a Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center in Buindi, and then distributing them to the most vulnerable households, working closely with the government, the Uganda Wildlife Authority, and the, you know, the head of the reform poachers and all those kind of groups, the local leaders to select the most vulnerable households, like the person who killed Rafiki, he came from such a household. So that's how we're doing it. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I see also some questions about the name of your coffee distributor. I think for any questions that relate to links or where to buy things, maybe you can post that or we can help you post it in your booth or in the, in the chat so that people can refer to it. And you can always reach back also to either directly to CTPH or to WCN, and we can make sure you have access that information. So I want to take a question on um, on uh, human wildlife coexistence. Uh, you mentioned that gorillas will still go out of a park to eat villagers' banana plantations. And so uh, apparently this person visited Windy back in 2015. Their guide had informed them that uh, tea bushes had been planted around the peripheries of a park um, as gorillas don't like the smell and it stopped them from crossing into the village. Is that, is that an effective technique? Is that still happening? Yes, tea is a very good buffer zone crop. And actually in the southern sector of Windy, it has been used. There's quite a large portion that the Uganda Wildlife Authority bought and planted tea, and the local community is benefiting from that tea. Somebody came and provided a market called Garuga. So tea is a very good buffer zone crop. Um, and when gorillas see tea, they're scared of crossing because it's a very, whereas other crops, they can maybe try and cross. So yes, it's a very good buffer zone. Great, thank you. But however, it's not the only crop that can help the gorillas. And actually, the coffee is another good one because when people grow coffee, they can also grow food to eat. So it's very good for food security. Whereas with tea, it takes up the whole, all of their space. But with coffee, they can plant fruit trees and other food. So as they're getting money from the cash crop, they can also get money from the food. So it's a combination of factors. Yeah, I think it's what's really important is to think about all these linkages, and that's what's so great about the, the One Health approach and your involvement in communities is to, to work out what's, what are real win-win situations and what piggybacks on each other. Um, stick, sticking around maybe public health question, what sort of health care access do the local people who live near the gorillas have in Uganda? Is there a local clinic, or must Ugandans, especially people close to the park, uh, travel long distances for for care, and what level of preventative care is there really for people? The healthcare access, I mean, the local, the clinics are still quite far away. Some of them are like 20 miles away, and people, and there's very little public transport. So what we've done as conservation through public health is we've strengthened community-based healthcare. So we're working with existing community health workers. In Uganda, we call them village health teams, and they're the ones who go and visit people's homes regularly, promoting good health, hygiene, sanitation, family planning, and all these things. Some of them give injections, some of them bring dewormers, and then they refer people who are sick. And while they're doing this, they're also promoting good conservation practices, telling people why, how to prevent disease between them and the gorillas, especially COVID-19, which is a big issue right now. But they're also talking about why it's important not to poach gorillas, especially during this difficult time when there are no tourists 
And that's a message we're really taking across right now, that tell your community members that convince them not to poach even when there's no tourists, because the gorillas have really lifted you out of poverty. So that's one a very important message they're also taking right now. Great. I was able to bring Susan back up. I know, Susan, you seem to be backlit. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> I'm trying, to, I'm trying to adjust. Yeah. You have a, <laughs> yeah. a question for Gladys and Lawrence. Go ahead, and then I'll I'll take you off screen uh, after the end of your question. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for the presentation. I am I had asked the hip hop a question, but I have two others. Um, one is also um, to include JG. It's about um, in the other conservationists, we don't often hear about health in the communities. So I'd like to ask about how your approach in your team is moving across to other conservation groups. And then my second unrelated is, often you find it very hard to get seedlings for these alternative livelihood programs also across conservation groups. So this is kind of a broader question, JG, for all conservation, but Gladys seems to be doing it around Windy and. I'm just curious where they get their seeds and then so seeds and health and how it can be expanded. So I'll answer quickly from, from WCN's perspective, but then I'm going to leave it to Gladys. I mean, these issues are, are uh, really important and a number of conservationists are in touch with one another. And I think that's one of the biggest thing about the platform is that all the conservationists can learn from each other in terms of how do they deal with their own health, the health of their teams, health issues within communities, there are very vast cultural differences from one country to another, but we have a very active uh, WhatsApp group, um, a very active email listserv, the conservations when we can get together uh, physically have the opportunity to share those, those stories. We organize these training workshops for conservationists and uh, we spend a lot of time thinking, you know, what are we going to present in terms of topics, but really we could just put the conservationists in one room and based on the experience in the room, we could just lock the door for three days and let them have it, and they would learn so much from one another. <laughs> Same thing goes for um, any kind of supply chain questions or how do they how do they get the kind of uh, materials that they need. And so there's a, a tremendous informal learning network within uh, the WCN conservationist. And then Gladys, you can answer those questions specifically for how it affects um, conservation through public health and your team in Uganda. Yes. Um... Starting with the, I mean, maybe just adding to the seedlings, uh, we're working with an expert in an agronomist, so he was able to locate some very good seedlings um, within Kampala, and then we were able to buy them and bring them to Bwindi and plant them in the nursery. And what we're planning to do is train other community members who are lead agriculturalists to also have nurseries at their home and they can reach out to more people. But I could give you the contact of those people. And then regarding getting other conservation organizations involved in health, um, we've made some progress. We're part of the PHE, Integrated Population Health Environment Network. Uh, we helped to set up the first PHE working group. We're managing that, we're the secretariat. And later we convinced the government and they set up their own national PHE network. And in the process, we started to influence other NGOs to take up health approaches. So for example, Bwindi and Mugahinga Conservation Trust around Bwindi also do, does some family planning work um, and a number of other groups, Ecological Christian Organization. So it's good. Other people are taking it up um, through the PHE network. And also we're part of the Uganda Poverty and Conservation Learning Group, which Suzanne is also part of. And they're also recognizing that family planning and healthcare is another dimension of poverty that needs to be addressed. And once you address both, then you're going to reduce poverty in the home. And once communities have a better well-being, they're less likely to poach, collect firewood, and do all these things, and it's better for the wildlife. Right, thank you. Gladys, actually, there's a question that's related to this, which, given your expertise in public health, have you been able to form any new partnerships because of your knowledge to share some uh, particular lessons from the pandemic or other episodes of zoonotic diseases? Um, yes, we've been able to form some partnerships, yep, and actually one of them, I would say, is we are now part of our Africa CSO Biodiversity Alliance, which is part of the Convention of Biological Diversity. It started to strengthen the Afri African voice in 
the CBD because it was mainly other voices, but the African voice wasn't coming out. And so when we told them what we're doing to prevent disease from people to gorillas during COVID, they were very interested in it. And now we developed a policy brief, um, which is about to come out. But yesterday we had a webinar and next Friday we're having another one trying to get all the, Af the countries in Africa that have gorillas and chimpanzees to adopt, you know, proper tourism. I mean, it's geared towards uh, responsible tourism. It's geared towards governments, donors, and tour operators, because they're the ones who market to their customers, their guests, the kind of experience they'll get when they come to Guindy or other places where the great apes are found. Okay. So there are 21 okay. countries in Africa with great apes, and 10 of them have active tourism sites, and all of them need to upgrade their great ape viewing rules, and so we saw it as an opportunity. Great. And actually, we'll stick a little bit with health. Um, this one health model, really, where you integrate um, human, wildlife, and livestock health. Um, do you see do you see opportunities for this model to be adopted across more communities, more conservation projects, um, especially in light of the uh, of the COVID nineteen pandemic? Yes, we see a lot of opportunity for it to be adopted. Um, definitely, in areas where great apes are found, the links are extremely obvious. We can very easily make the great apes sick because we're so similar, 90, over 98% DNA. Um, and we share the same protein receptors that the virus likes to attach to, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also in savanna habitats, for example. Um, we started a small program there in Queen Elizabeth National Park, can work in savanna habitats because the cattle keepers who are always entering the park and encroaching and the poachers, they are, cons they are more concerned about their livestock and so by improving the health of their livestock through community conservation animal health workers, we've started to work with those kind of groups as well, then you're able to have the One Health approach working really well because it caters for livestock health, human health, and the health of the wildlife in general. So we're looking at all of that because zoonotic diseases can spread between, let's say, cattle and buffalo because they're closely related, or you know, goats and Uganda cob or other antelope. And so that whole approach works even in areas where you don't have great apes. And we're seeing more partnerships coming up and more people who'd like to adopt the approach. Great. And we're happy to train them and work with the partners. Thank, thank you. So I was able to, uh, to add uh, Dana to our call. Uh, Dana just uh, watched your presentation. Yeah. And so Dana, did you have a question you for the CTPH team? You might be muted, Dana. Well, we can't hear you. Um, no. I'm going to get Gladys onto some other question. We'll see if you come back. And then, um, Gladys, maybe you could talk about um, whether you're doing any genetic research on the groups. And are there any issues of bottlenecking? And maybe you could define what bottlenecking, bottlenecking is in genetics for a for population of gorillas? Um, I'm not necessarily an expert on genetics, but the Max Planck Institute has been doing a lot of genetics work around Windy, and they're doing a lot of paternity studies. What is really interesting is, you know, interesting facts like the silverback is not always the only father in the group. He may think he is, but when they do paternity studies, they find some of the younger males are also mating, which is, which is important for genetic diversity in such a, a, a species with such a small population of just over 1,000. And we've also found that during gorilla censuses, some gorillas build more than one nest. You'd think that it's only one gorilla builds each own nest, but when you look at the fecal samples and compare with the group size, you find that some of them build more than one nest. So all of that is going on anyway. Um, and yeah, there is a problem of inbreeding with the, with the gorillas, the mountain gorillas, because they only have a baby once every four to five years. And so they're not helping themselves in that way. And the human population is growing much faster than, you know, people have babies every year. But that's why through our programs of family planning, we're finding that people are no longer having babies every year, which is great. And so there is an element of inbreeding, but as long as other males can mate, and not only the silverback, um, hopefully that rate will reduce. And as the population grows, then hopefully there'll be more genetic diversity. Great. I see a question here about um, whether you work closely with a government. And can you uh, tell us maybe a little bit about the relationship between uh, CTPH and, and government agencies, and maybe just conservation in general, and 
government agencies in Uganda? Yes, we work very closely with the government. Actually, my first job was as a first vet for the government agency. And so ever since then, maybe that has made it a lot easier for me to work with the government. Um, and they understood why we've set up conservation through public health, because we got scabies and gorillas which came from people. They've been extremely supportive all the way. They even invited me back onto their board. And I sat on the Wildlife Authority board and helped to improve on how they engage communities, because now I'd had a lot more experience. We had had a lot more experience doing it as CTPH, and we're pleased to have resulted in them upgrading. They now have a deputy director of community conservation, which they didn't have before, based on the experiences that we had and other board members. So yes, we're trying hard. We also enabled the gorilla permits, for example, it used to be $5 per permit going to the local community. But through the Uganda Poverty and Conservation Learning Group, when I sat on the board of the Wildlife Authority, we were able to increase it to $10. And yeah, we continue to work closely with them. We, we train the park staff. Whenever we meet with the community members, our village health and conservation teams, or the gorilla guardians, or the reform poachers, or the different groups we work with, we always invite the Uganda Wildlife Authority to speak. And they also tell them what they would like them to tell the communities, maybe you know how better to share tourism revenue, all kinds of topics. Right. And then we also work closely with the Ministry of Health and they also attend all our meetings as well. So the community sees the link between health and conservation. Great. We're going to take a, a, a sidestep to another topic and talk a little bit about uh, gorilla biology. So I've got a, a, several other questions. But from a, from a sorry, gorilla uh, DJ, behavior DJ, issue. Yeah. DJ, just to add something else that I think has come out of the COVID-19 pandemic is that we sit on the COVID-19 task force for the Ministry of Health. And we are the only conservation NGO there at the moment, together with the Uganda Wildlife Authority as the other conservation entity from government. And we've really been able to influence the way that they are managing the pandemic in Uganda. For example, if nobody wants the gorillas or chimps to get sick, and they're always seeking our opinion on what should be done in all these ways. And something we're really pleased about is when tourism opened up for, you know, in general, which is a couple of months ago, the president of Uganda himself said, we should not yet open for gorilla and chimpanzee tourism because we shouldn't make our cousins sick. And I was really pleased about that because yeah. they influence the president as well. So we're just pleased that through our role on the task force, everybody got to understand that it's important not to make the great apes sick. Yeah, thank you very much for that. So switching a bit to, to some behavioral questions, um, there's a question about what is the percentage of habituated groups versus well groups of gorillas? And I assume you probably can't say that at large, but maybe specifically for uh, the area that you work in. And do you see any differences in the way that these habituated versus non-habituated gorillas interact with one another? That's a great question. Um, currently in Uganda, half the gorillas in Gwindi which has around 460 mountain gorillas, a minimum of 460. Half of them are habituated for tourism and half of them are not. Um, so it's around about the 50% mark at the moment, um, I would say. Maybe just under half are habituated. And, but then in uh, Virunga, a lot more are habituated. I think in Rwanda, almost all of them. And as far as the differences in how they interact, we find that because most of the habituated gorilla groups in Buindi are at the edge of the park where a tourist can go in and come out and come out on the same day and nobody wants to camp in the forest. So you find that the habituated groups tend to mix with each other. So if one gorilla leaves one group, you find them in another group. And that's what we're tending to find. They're not mixing so much with the unhabituated ones. And the ones that are not habituated are too far in and which is great because we really need to have that control group. Because if they're to pick up a disease from people, God forbid, which we want to ensure that there's a control group that doesn't have to get that disease. And so, yeah, we're trying hard to make sure that not all the gorillas are habituated um, by, you know, advocating to the government. But they, I think they're also realizing, like with COVID-19, it's really obvious that. Because once you habituate a gorilla group, you have to follow it every single day for the rest of its life, whether or not they're tourists. And now when there are no tourists, you still have that cost. And it's and there is it's much easier to poach a habituated gorilla group, and that's how Rafiki got killed. All his life, he's been seeing people, and so when the poacher came along, he couldn't tell the difference between someone who's good or bad, and he ended up being speared. And so there is that very delicate balance. 
Yeah, that's a, a tragic note. I'm going to ask this question and then I'll I'll ask a, probably what might be a final one after that. But do you believe that the 11 year sentence um, for the, the killer of Rafiki is going to be a strong deterrent to other potential poachers? Um, yeah, that it definitely will be because it's the longest sentence anyone has ever received for killing a gorilla. Sadly, um, nine years ago, somebody killed a gorilla in the same way as Rafiki was killed. And, you know, our team did the post-mortem and it was obvious he speared the gorilla several times. He was a playful backpack called Mizano. And again, he was so used to people and he got into a fight with the poacher's hunting dog. Hmm. And that's why the, why the poacher killed him because he used a hunting dog to kill Diker and Bushpig. And, but he got away with nothing, basically. $20 is all he had to pay. It turned out that the magistrate didn't realize gorillas are important or there was something going on, but everybody was very, very upset. But since that time, the Uganda Wildlife Authority has trained, got together with the magistrates and trained them on the importance of a gorilla. And so now when Rafiki was killed, the person got 11 years and hopefully it will deter others from doing it. Good. We think it's a big deterrent, but we also need to look at other things that led to the poaching such as addressing hunger and desperation in these communities. No, that's, that's very true to, to think about all the their circumstances around this. Um, I think I want to close out by asking you both, um, and if you can bring also the perspective of, of your team and your community members, what gives you hope? What gives you hope for, for mountain gorillas and for coexistence between people and wildlife and where you, where you work? You take that. Oh, well, that's... That's a very important question. I mean, what gives me hope and the whole team hope is that we've made a lot of progress in changing communities' attitudes to conservation. Um, by improving their healthcare, we're showing them that we care not only about the wildlife, but we also care about the people as well. And we're seeing changes. I mean, for example, the Batwa kidneys who used to be in the forest and were evicted when guerrilla tourism began. It was so nice when we were in a meeting, actually with Task Trust, donors came to visit and the lady said I want to visit the two the gorillas as a tourist you know these are people who were very had had a high level of poaching because they were always dependent on the forest to survive so we're seeing a big change in people's attitudes towards conservation which is great and that gives me a lot of hope and I feel that because communities are appreciating the gorillas it's their future they're really seeing the gorillas as their future I feel that the gorillas have a very big chance. Um, the numbers are growing, likely the mountain gorillas are growing, and it's the only subspecies of gorilla that's growing. And I think largely a lot of it is to do with the community engagement, improved veterinary care, improved monitoring and research and law enforcement. But that community engagement is so important. This week, when we're in Buindi, actually there's a German TV crew that was filming our work because they're looking at writing, doing a story on zoonosis and pandemics and gorilla conservation and human health. And they also filmed people in Mount Elgon who are dealing with bats. So they wanted to cover the whole cycle of how pandemics come about. And they can jump from animals to people and then people back to animals. And the community, put, a lady put up a hand and said, thank you for bringing the tourists. We haven't seen them for, since March. And, you know, people brought out their crafts and the little children took out some drawings of gorillas that they had made and they were wearing their masks. They looked really cute. They were really professional. They couldn't be more than six or seven years old. And they did make some money that day as well. So that was very encouraging. There was, there was an air of tourism has, is coming back. So Thank you. <laughs> and Lawrence, what gives you hope quickly? I'm wearing it. Gorilla <laughs> Thanks, uh, JG. And thank you so much for all the support, the great support, WCN, the donors, the supporters. It's just amazing. And um, uh, it, we hope to host you again in Buindi. And thank you so much. It's, it's, our, it's our pleasure. Uh, thank you to you and your teams. Um, we know that it takes a lot of work um, day in, day out from community members and from uh, Ugandans at all levels from your team, communities, government, everywhere to make a difference. So thank you so much for your work. Um, I want to thank everybody for staying on in this uh, extended Q&A. We're going to close it down now. You can, I think, go and join in. I, I've lost somewhat track of what's happening with the rest of the schedule, but I think there are other Q&As happening for 
other species at the moment. And then at the uh, top of the hour, in about 15 minutes, we will uh, reconvene on the blue stage for our uh, final presentation on pangolins. So I want to wish you all the best. And uh, we'll see you soon. And I hope to see you one day in Uganda, Gladys and Lawrence. Uh, and if you ever come through uh, San Francisco, let us know. We'd love to see you again. So have a great, have a great evening. Great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. And stay safe and healthy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah.